Hi, everybody. Welcome to Anthologies Aren't Easy. Um, we have four really awesome panelists here who are very experienced with publishing and being part of anthologies. So I'm going to be talking to them about a lot of different aspects around these books that are super popular right now. So first of all, I want to talk about the popularity of anthologies because that's probably why you're all here. Um, so raise your hand if you've been part of an anthology or you bought an anthology or you know somebody that's been in an anthology. Anthologies are like the plague of comics right now in a good way. They're everywhere, everyone wants to be part of them, and they're really doing a lot of great transformative things for various topics in comics and for different artists in comics. So I want to talk about the advantages that it's giving people and then all of your personal experiences in all of your aspects of working with anthologies. Um, but to get started, I took some questions on Twitter to see what people wanted to know about anthologies from you guys. So I'm going to start with this very pressing question. Actually, no. I'm going to introduce everyone first. Ooh. Good idea. I should look at my notes. <laughs> All right, so first I'm going to introduce myself just so you know who is talking to you right now. Um, this just doesn't work. All right. My name is Kelly Phillips. Uh, my involvement with anthologies is I am the editor and publisher of Dirty Diamonds, which is an all girl comic anthology. Um, we're debuting our latest issue, Beauty, today. Um, and then my other work is around this comic called Weird Me, where I was the teenage webmaster of a Weird Al fan site, and I'm debuting that full series here today. Um, so I'm now going to run through all the panelists, and I want you guys to talk about your work around anthologies, anything you have <coughs> debuting at SPX, amp yourselves up a whole bunch. Also, as a precursor to this, I haven't made a PowerPoint presentation since I was in about ninth grade, so I was really excited, and there are lots of transitions in this presentation. <laughs> So get ready for that. All right, first we have Annie. Hey, what's up? Oh, you want me to talk? <laughs> uh, my name is Annie Stoll. Um, my day job is I'm an art director at Sony Music, and uh, my night job is I love comics. I make comic anthologies. Um, I recently made Hanadoki Kira, which is um, a shoujo anthology from uh, 26 different artists that's all about sort of uh, your recollections and feeling about the shoujo genre. Um, and then I am currently working with Kevin J. Stanton, putting together um, a massive anthology called A Thousand One Nights. Um, you guys are seeing the first cover reveal, um, so you guys are the first uh, people in the public to actually see this. So yay! Um, <laughs> and um, what A Thousand One Nights is, um, is it's a massive uh, three-volume anthology. There's over two 270 artists, um, three volumes, as like I said, and there will be 1,001 characters represented. Um, the important thing about this anthology is that as people positive, all gender IDs are welcome in both creators and um, characters within the book. Here you go. <laughs> welcome. Thanks. All right, next we have Josh Bear. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Josh Bear. The piece represented appears for my anthology, Suspect Device. And um, I do a lot of my own work, too. And I teach in uh, New York. And I have a lot to say about this topic, but uh, we can, you'll get, I'll get introduced through the process of being interviewed. And we also have Isaac. Hi, I'm Isaac Cates. Uh, I edit and publish a, and contribute to uh, an ongoing comic called Cartosia Tales that is, um, I guess it's an anthology. I mean, it's got nine stories by nine different people in each issue. Um, as we work on it, it's been sort of growing together so that there's more uh, cross-pollination and more feedback among the stories so that it is starting to feel more like a group authored thing instead of a, um, instead of just an anthology, instead of you know several separate things in the same book. I think if you picked up the first issue, you would have the sense that it was an anthology series. And if you read the first six or seven, you get a, you get a sense instead that it was all kind of aiming at, not telling a single story, but telling a, um, telling a bunch of related stories collaboratively. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Great. Welcome. And lastly, we have Josh O'Neill. Um, Josh didn't send me any pictures, <laughs> despite having really beautiful books. So I'm sorry I had to do this. You could have just gotten the pictures off our website. You but know? then you don't learn. <laughs> 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 
You guys can expect a lot of this panel to be uh, Kelly assassinating my character <laughs> and <laughs> every opportunity. This is just the beginning. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm Josh O'Neill. Sad person. I don't know. <laughs> I'm the editor. I heard that, that you actually did send pictures to Kelly, and she's <laughs> only doing this to get to get like points. I, I just sent so her the, the wrong. I've got your picks. back. Is what I'm saying. He actually told his co-collaborator to send me pictures, and then he did not send me pictures. Oh. Yeah. So that's why you do your own work, Josh. <laughs> I have so many lessons to learn today. <laughs> I think I'm going to emerge from this panel a better person than I came in. That's the entire point of it. <laughs> it's all for you. But anyway, we'll if I could actually fun. introduce myself to the nice people here. <laughs> I'm the publisher of Locus Moon Press. We're a small press company from Philadelphia. Uh, we do a sort of wide variety of, of independent comics, and a lot of them are anthology projects. We did a book with Dark Horse a few years ago called Once Upon a Time Machine that was uh, science fiction fairy tales, all different writers and artists taking on classic stories and giving them futuristic twists. We do a quarterly comics anthology series called Quarter Moon um, that I'm the editor of. Um, we did a book last year called Little Nemo Dream Another Dream uh, that actually won the Eisner for best uh, anthology. It's a collection of tributes to Little Nemo and Windsor McKay by 140 amazing comic artists. That's me, the guy who doesn't send pictures. But puts really great books together. Um, so this is our team. They're going to be tackling these topics. And the first question I have for you comes from Box Brown on Twitter. Uh -oh. And it's, aren't anthologies actually pretty easy? <laughs> 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 so what goes into an anthology? What makes it hard or easy? Really blanket over the top. It's easier to make an anthology than to do that much work yourself. In that way, I suppose they are easy. I mean, you know, I, we've got... Uh, 300 and something pages of work that we've drawn in the last couple of years and I know I couldn't have drawn 300 pages of comics in two years because I, I also have a day job um, but there are things about running an anthology of course that are a lot harder than drawing just by yourself you know like uh, mm -hmm. you have to deal with other people <laughs> and, and you know there's there's also the other end of it too you know you're gonna produce something you've got to just you've got to you, you're not just drawing uh, if you're editing and publishing a thing, it's not it's not just about producing the art that you could show to one other person. The the some of the hard part is in um, is after it's produced. Do you want to go down the line or come back? No, I don't know. Shout out. Okay, okay. Um, well, I would say that yes and no, <laughs> which is the worst answer, right? Um, I think anthologies are easy in so far as that if there's an idea or a, a topic that's like really important to you that you really believe in, I think it's easy to get a bunch of your friends together and say, you know what, this isn't addressed. Let's get together. Let's make art about this. Let's put this together in a book. Um, now more than ever, and in the future, there will be even more resources that are just available to you, whether you're doing a small anthology or whether you're being like me and a crazy person and getting 300 people together in three books. Um, so in the sense that is it easy to get some people together? Yeah, that's the easy part. Um, where I think it becomes harder is, you know, artists are a bunch of cats. Like, you have to wrangle them. Um, it's hard to uh, be stay organized, to be on task, and to be on point. That's when things get hard. Is it impossible? Absolutely not. Um, but I think making sure that you're organized is probably the most key point. And um, I would say... Um, the most important thing to me is always knowing when to ask questions and when to reach out for help. Um, for instance, like I am terrible at math. I failed a math regents. <laughs> like it's just not my thing. But I recognize that about myself, and I try to find other people who can help me to make it stronger. So if I can't do math, I will find someone that can do it for me, and we can do the math to make sure that this book is the right amount of pages, is the right on cost. Um, so just not being afraid to ask questions and to reach out to people who can help you and strengthen you. Yeah, I think it depends on how good you are, uh, what your skill set it, what your skill set is, as far as being a chief editor, and then how much resources you have for the stuff you're not good at. I've learned like over time, um, I need a, I need like a, um, you know, somebody to oversee production. What do you call that position? Uh, quality supervisor. Um, so, and then sometimes a lot of people are willing to do that stuff for free. 
um, we'll look, then at a certain point, if you have the resources, you can pay people. So, I mean, easy, uh, I think you could replace the word cheap with, with easy. It's like, depends on how much energy you wanna spend and how much resources you wanna spend, financial or otherwise. I'd also like to add that Box is probably comparing, when he says easy, he's probably thinking relative to powerlifting. <laughs> he, you know, I think he thinks about the training that goes into going into the ring and being a pro wrestler and you know, how much you can deadlift. And so compared to that, I, you know, yeah, maybe it's not that hard. Well, I, I mean, moving books is not easy, and you get a lot of books with anthology. Oh, let me tell That's you, heavy. <laughs> try having a thousand books on a pallet show up to your like little tiny Manhattan apartment, <laughs> and your entire apartment is nothing but books. Like, yeah. so they're a box brown. <laughs> it's physically hard. Yeah, our shipment of the Little Nemo book was 54 tons That's of books. A lot. We had to take them off the truck by hand. <laughs> It took like 12 hours of moving boxes. There were four of us. <laughs> so that part was not easy. If you'd made the book smaller, it yeah. would have been a lot light, lighter. That's true. That's true. I'm going to learn that lesson for next time. <laughs> really <laughs> meaningful like like postage stamp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you all aren't familiar with the Little Nemo book, it is literally that big. It's 16 it's, by it's 21. Like tabloid it's size. Tall. Yeah. Awesome. Ten, 10 pounds each. All right, good. So I liked this question a lot because it really begs the question of the name of the panel. So as a follow-up, we got the question, what is the hardest part about the anthology process? So you guys talked a little bit about that, um, but I want to dig into what I think is the hardest part and then your thoughts on that. So more transitions. Um, aside from your cat walking all over your projects, what is the hardest part? So where do you start? <laughs> like, what made you want to create an anthology? What were you trying to accomplish with your anthology? What was important for you to get out of this project? Which, you just asked like four different questions, yeah. all totally different answers. <laughs> like, what, what was the trigger for your anthology? Well, I mean, I, th I think in a lot of ways the hardest part is coming up with a, a concept for an anthology that actually, I mean, a, anybody can put together a bunch of comic art into one book but like coming up with something that's gonna feel like this thematic thing like the book is an actual experience and not just a jumble of stuff and something that's gonna excite the cartoonists involved uh, to get the best work out of them um, and not just be like the next project that they're doing but like a sort of new adventure um, that's I mean the inception of it is hard I mean uh, uh, Josh puts together those uh, suspect device uh, books that are such a brilliant idea. Um, I won't describe the idea, you can describe it yourself, but it gets, it gets cartoonists so excited about like doing this thing, it's this fun game that they're playing. Um, and so you get this like awesome work out of people. Um, so that's the, I mean, to get going is difficult. And then the other hard part is at the end. The middle's fun. <laughs> you know? uh, the logistics of deadlines and uh, files and when you're working with dozens or sometimes hundreds of people on these things. It's just very, very complicated logistically. Um, so, but the middle part where everybody's just sending you artwork and you're like, cool, that's, that's, the, that's the sweet spot. I think getting started is hardest with anything. I, n I probably never would have done my first issue of Suspect Device if um, I got invited to do a comic book insert in my friend's magazine. And then when I told, he said, yeah, 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 to my idea. And then Suspect Device uses a lot of appropriation um, where I have people, um, you can show some of the images from it if, you, if that stuff is available. Um, I think you we can't have do it on the next slide. Okay, I'll show you later, later. But you actually will take two frames from unrelated comics and paste them into your page and then you make up all the steps between them. So if I give you panel A and panel Z, you have to do like B through uh, Y. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, um, and then, uh, so the guy who uh, was supposed to be accepting the comic book insert got cold feet. He said, oh, that's going to, um, I don't like the legal implications of that. So I had already invited people. And then I said, well, I'm just going to keep on moving with this. I think that I probably would have kind of coasted for a long time with that, that extra push. And um, 
I think I think with art uh, and publishing especially, if, if you're like inertia is a big part of the whole equation. Once you, it's really wrenching to actually make yourself do your first project, and then afterwards, it's like, you know, hopefully it creates like a, a rhythm, you know, like a domino effect. You do you go on to the next one and the next one. So I, I think I might have, I've never been somebody who really wanted to take that plunge. It seems really scary and a big commitment. So I was kind of, I kind of once I got in uh, and I'd already invited people, I was stuck. The other part, um, to answer the other end of the question, I think that the hardest part dealing with, is dealing with some of the personalities of cartoonists, especially um, when, you, when people flake out and um, Josh, I think we both dealt with the same pers personality. We can talk about them later. But I know we worked <laughs> on the same artist with another project I'm doing where some of these, some of these artists are like broken down, low-functioning alcoholics. <laughs> to, um, and there, there could be money involved, too. Suspect device is somebody doesn't do work for me. Um, that's no big deal. I don't pay anybody except for the cover artist. But the, I do another project I'll talk about later. And I've like discovered the full gamut of what type of cartoonists are out there. You discover there's some which are super pro. And then there's some who have rumors that plague them their whole career in the industry of flaking out and disappearing and being undependable and gaming you. Like I talked to um, an old Marvel guy who he, he was supposed to ship me some art. And he was like, I swear I have it. He goes, I'm not doing the full the editor game and I'm like wow is there a fool the editor game is that because he, he's like an old an old old super pro who, who delivered on schedule every month for years so I, that's been very very eye-opening and there's nothing worse than giving especially if you give somebody some money and they give you their word to have them just disappear and refuse to respond to your emails and I have a I have a lot of stories like 97 percent stories of good dependable artists and I have like three percent stories like that and they're maddening yeah, I, I think Annie a while ago said cartoonists are cats, and I think you meant like it's like herding cats. Yeah. I would actually say there, there's like there's some people who are cats and some who are dogs and some who are horses or fish or something. That they're they're really I mean there are some people who are just completely dependable, and you'll say I need this uh, by the end of the week and you'll get it on Wednesday, and there are other people who um, are perennially going to make you sweat because they're going to turn stuff in at the 11th hour or the 13th hour. Um, this most recent issue, not through any fault really of, uh, of well, not through maybe anybody's fault, but in the most recent issue of uh, Cartesia Tales, I, I had to deliver the PDFs to the print shop in order to get the book here for SPX. Had to deliver them on a uh, Tuesday, which is the day I teach, so I had to have them ready before I went to sleep. And the last page came to me at 2 a.m. Um, that was before I put everything into InDesign. So I had at least another hour of work ahead of me. And, and uh, the, the pages came to me uh, computer lettered. Um, and I kind of didn't like the way they looked. So I hand lettered uh, patches for all four pages in the story, which didn't really take that long. It was like another extra hour of work. But when you're putting it in between 3 and 4 in the morning and you got to get up at 6, it's really kind of. I don't know, maybe it was sort of stupid. But it looks better that way. And I, and I don't, I'm not running down the contributor, actually, in this case. She, she was running late because um, of supply chain problems earlier in the, in the process. Although there are other people who are kind of consistently behind. And, then, and I've also had a couple of people who had committed to be in the, we have guest stars in each issue. There's seven people who are in every issue, and then, uh, or seven teams. Actually, there's eight. We have a sort of phantom eighth contributor, but that we have two guest stars in each issue, and these are usually kind of big names in indie comics, like we have Dylan Horrocks in our first issue, and Luke Pearson's in our fifth issue, and they were great, They've, they've been great to work with. Um, uh, the, w I piled up a whole bunch of people when we were doing our initial Kickstarter to raise the money to, to do the book, and a f couple of the people who are slated to contribute to later issues have just realized they don't have time. Their life situation has changed. So they're out, and that means that if I'm going to have two guest stars in each issue, I have to find new people. I probably spent, I don't know, I had uh, anxiety every, uh, every week this summer, sending out emails to people who said no, 
eventually catching a few people who said yes. I'm still not 100% sure about one of the people in the 10th issue, but I've got almost all of it nailed down now, and I'm sort of breathing a sigh of relief, except that I have to reprint the first issue because we're running out, and I'm going to add new pages by new people, and I want them to be name people, and that means I have to start the whole process of asking, uh, issuing invitations again. Um, and, you know, I'm psyched about the people who've said yes, and there's some other people who've already said no, and I just keep going, flipping through my Rolodex or my imaginary Rolodex, mm -hmm. trying to find the people who, who will say yes. And eventually it, it all comes together and it looks seamless and beautiful. But there is a lot of hard work just like sending out emails and, and keeping in touch with people and keeping in contact, and like, hey, can you tell me what, how far along are you with this story, you know? Are we talking like, are you going to make this late? Because if I've got four people who are st staying up late to get it done, and one of them just is not is not communicating with me, I worry that I, I'm not. I don't want to make the other people pull an all-nighter in order to make that little deadline. Um, and they don't send you progress shots. Like, what's so hard about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or even just like tell me uh, it's all it's all penciled. You know, I trust them. I, the people that I'm working with, I trust. It's the it's when they don't communicate with me that I know that they don't they don't have something. Um, I don't even know if I would call that the hardest part. I mean, there's a lot of anguish in the sort of fear, fear of rejection or whatever. You send something out to some big name cartoonist and you think that they're probably going to say no and they wait a couple of weeks to email you and then you have to like send them a DM on Twitter or something to say, hey, did you get my email? And they write you back and say, oh yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> um, uh, the hard part, honestly for me, the hard part is less a, less an anthology thing and just a um, you know, it's just money. Money is the hard part. <laughs> I want to be able to talk about some money. <laughs> I want to be able to pay the contributors more than I'm paying them. I want to be able to pay my bills at the print shop. My Kickstarter money ran out. I always knew that it would. I thought that I would be better off when it did than I am. And so, you know, I can't just go to the bank and write, or can't just go to the print shop and write a check for the new printing of issue number one. I'm gonna have to go again on Kickstarter. And I don't know, you can all watch for news of that next month. <laughs> I, I have to go record a video of myself and then edit the video myself <laughs> using skills I don't have. Let's film it right now. Are you, there's a camera. <laughs> Just give me money. <laughs> If all of you here <laughs> just toss a couple hundred bucks down, <laughs> we'd be in business. So to run an anthology, you're wearing so many different hats. Yeah. And you have this one passion where you're trying to create this project. So how do you manage all of these other logistical loose ends that you may not be experienced with and you may not be great with, but you somehow have all pulled it together. You've all put out your books. So how have you guys worked through those problems? Um, well, I would say that to my earlier point, and I'll just stress this the whole time, um, it's really important to know what your strengths and your weaknesses are. So if you know that there's something that really gives you anxiety, you're like, oh gosh, I'm really scared to like talk to people. I'm really, you know, this part I'm not so great at. Find someone that can help you that can do that. Um, a Thousand One Nights, I'm working with um, Kevin J. Stanton. And he is so great at remembering people's names, at being on point, um, at just you know networking. And I'm good at networking, but I'm not Kevin's level. And I knew that it was important to have someone like Kevin to balance me out because I'm doing the behind the scenes stuff, I'm doing the design, I'm sort of having this architect's moment, and then Kevin's like my partner. And he is great with being able to deal with everyone on the day-to-day, -day, where I can deal with everyone on the overall sort of um, things, coming up with the strategy, coming up with the branding, and then art directing um, different people who need it. Um, so f to, to me, it's more about finding who can help you to get the parts that you need to get done. Um. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Any other triumphs, you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a lot of desperate last minute scrambling, <laughs> mostly. I mean, the, I, one of the horrible and good things about putting together projects like that is that you have to there are so many elements of the job that you learn so much from doing them, but the only reason you learn so much is that you go in not knowing how to do them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they're they're very rewarding experiences, but they're it's very it can be a very 
desperate late night kind of situation a lot of times. Oh, yeah, I think there's a lot of fearlessness in going into making a project like this. Yep, you're like, yeah, it's, no, hundred percent. It's gonna be there one day. Uh, I would say I would add too, like if you are someone who's thinking about you know doing anthology, that's something you're really interested in. Like I know like a lot of my panelists, fellow panelists, are like really accomplished. It's intimidating to be with you guys. Like you're really amazing, and you know you yourself going out to to make something, you know. It's really important to dream really big. I'm very guilty of like dreaming the biggest dream I can, but it's also important to recognize to start small. You know what I mean? You don't have to have your first anthology be like a million artists. You could have like five people. You know what I mean? You could have three people. You know, just mm -hmm. start small because that way you learn. And if that is even a little, um, I guess, intimidating to you, try contributing to an anthology and talk to the people who are making one. You know, really ask people questions and be like, okay, like, what step are you at? What would you recommend I do if I do the same thing? And, and with that, um, I'd also recommend that, you know, you uh, do have a good idea, like, going, going into it. Um, I was talking to somebody from Fanagraphics who was telling me that even books of like collections of artists, short pieces, like, you know, I'm, I'm blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna do all my short pieces I've done for other people's anthology to put them in one book. Unless you're somebody who's like a mega god of cartooning, there's probably not, they don't sell that well. If you think about yourself at a bookstore, you do t people do tend to like kind of good gimmicky ideas, you know, so. Um, everybody's doing comics about Joan Jett, or everybody's doing comics about, um, I don't know, I think like pizza, I think specific is good, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, maybe not a gluten-free, you know, a uh, gluten-free anthology, that's, like, that's <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to hear about, but. Um, Are these all trademark Josh Bayer? <laughs> I, have, I, have like a, I have more ideas that I wanna do, uh, I, my problem is I forget them pretty quickly, but I, I you know, like everybody, you know, doing. Did, did somebody do an anthology about Point Break? Probably. Yeah. I Speci need this in my life. <laughs> yeah. Specific <laughs> ideas like that are good, and um, you know, there's kind of a that extra recogni recognition factor. I mean, Suspect Device was such. I felt like it was such a cheat to get to kind of get my foot in the door of the comics community because I was grabbing all these appropriated characters. Like everybody, Garfield and Nancy already have a big audience. So if you're doing a comic book about, you know, again, like, uh, you know, there's, I guess, like, everybody doing, like, the worst job they've ever had. That's probably been done before, too. That's all, that's stuff that people can relate to in a general way, and there's stuff people can relate to in a pop culture way. Everybody doing a comic about Dan Cortez, you know? And then, um, um, there's something I was gonna add, and I can't remember what it is. I'll add really quick to that. I think that if you're going to do an anthology, like it's a lot of work, like we've been saying, so make sure it's something you're passionate about. Don't do a pizza anthology just because pizza's in and you think you'll sell a lot of books. <laughs> like if pizza is your true life calling, make a pizza anthology. But if it's not, find that thing that is really important to you because you as the person putting it together, like you're the front man or woman, like you're the person who is like really championing this, you're gonna have to live this a lot and it should be something that you feel passionate about because you can talk a lot about it. Um, I would also add that, you know, looking around at what other people are doing is great, but um, also looking for gaps, like, you know, is there a topic that hasn't been addressed a lot? Is there something that, you know, could really help people or help yourself or fellow artists? Thinking about things like that can also be a good way to give you inspiration. I think that's, I mean, when I was, coming up with and pitching Cartesia Tales to the, the people who wound up being in the core group and the <coughs> early guest stars. And it, it was, uh, it's interesting, the, the way that I wind up describing it at conventions usually is about how we make it. You know, uh, there's nine stories in each issue, they're done by different people and they, at the beginning of work on each issue, we're all shuffled around the map so we don't draw in the same place as we've drawn before. We don't draw the same characters we've drawn before. And it gradually starts to come to be this world that we're all working on together. Um, but I, that's not the way that, that's not the emphasis that I was putting on it when we first started working on it. It was like, don't you want to have smart indie comics for kids? Do you want to have smart indie fantasy comics for kids? Like something that a kid that is really into uh, Harry Potter and Miyazaki movies can go do next that's not just going to be a bunch of, I don't know, I, I, I hate to 
like stereotype high fantasy, but you know, there's like, there's the inherited worlds that are sort of Tolkien-esque and I didn't want to do something like that. I wanted to do something that felt like the way the Oz books felt to me when I was a kid and I found them in the library. And you know, it was like this weird idiosyncratic world that, that you know, I wanted something like that. And I really, I, I think I started work on it because I had a kid and I wanted something like that to give him. And, uh, and so in that way, I, I almost kind of wish that my conceit for making it were a little bit less elaborate. But it's hard, to, it's hard to encapsulate what the appeal of the sort of quirky fantasy universe is, you know? Like, I want to I wanna say, yeah, there's this little, there's a girl. She's not an otter girl. She's half otter girl, and she can't find her dad. And that she's been kind of cast out. Well, she chose to be cast out of her underwater society that we never see. But she's on the land looking for her dad, and she finds a guy who says he's her dad, but... Or no, he's, there's a guy who says he's her dad, but he's lying. <laughs> and then she finds a guy who's supposed to be her dad, but he keeps saying that he's not. And he's supposed to train her to be an adventurer. At least that's what she thinks. And I want, if I could pitch, like, there, that's one story, and there's, you know, four or five other continuing stories. And I, I, I don't know, I, that's the thing I want it to be, hmm. but it's not, a, it's not as easy to describe as pizza. <laughs> So I don't know. I don't, I don't know what it is. That's a good transition into the next topic I want to cover. Um, so this is talking about a lot of the hard stuff, but there is a lot of really fun, artful stuff that goes into anthologies. So something that I really enjoy is the putting the book together part. So once you have all these pieces in, you have to put the book together in a really meaningful way. So I was talking to um, Hazel Newlevant, who just put out Chainmail Bikini, which is a really great gamer anthology. Mm -hmm. Um, and she described the way that you arrange an anthology like putting together a mixtape. Mm. Like there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. You want to make sure it has a good flow. So, more transitions. <laughs> um, some general questions for you guys around this. Uh, so what goes into an as assembling one of your anthologies? Um, what kind of content are you looking for to put in your anthology? And then how do you construct your book to form a narrative from all of these different artists' work? Well, it's interesting trying like once you once you've put together the like the material, you have all this stuff, and then you need to put it in a sequence. That is definitely the most fun part because that's the part where anthologies are easy because it's it's a lot of work in its own weird way. But you kind of have the illusion of now becoming the author of the whole thing in that moment because like you're weaving. It's like when you make a mixtape and like you didn't make any of that music, but you're like, this is my mixtape. This is an expression of me. Sort of when it becomes your baby. <laughs> yeah, it does. Out of all your little assembled contributor babies. Yeah, that's not how babies work, actually. <laughs> how are babies made? Don't take any of this as fact. <laughs> <laughs> just take an arm from one baby. And just... <laughs> It doesn't work that way. It's oh like my god, Nina. Right? One thing that I find interesting is like how anthologies form these these little communities. Um, when you put together this this list of contributors, um, they may be all people that you are connected to in some way, or people that you just reached out to, but many of them may know or not know each other. Um, but when you start sending people works in progress, like showing people what's going on with the book, they start communicating with each other. Um, I feel like every, every anthology book that we put together becomes this little miniature society where people are appreciating each other's artwork, inspired by each other's artwork, jealous and angry about each other's artwork. Um, and I think that really helps like bring a project together and, and helps people work more in unison. Uh, I really love that point. Um, I think it's really important to bring people together. Um, whenever I work on an anthology, to me, like you know, it's important to have like a hashtag. It's important to have like a group of some sort of area where the other artists can speak to each other, or learn from each other, communicate. Um, I want everyone to get along, <laughs> and um, I mean, I've been fortunate enough that the things I've worked on have been. Um, as far as um, what goes into assembling it, um, as far as the design of it, like that's kind of like my jam. Like I love, you know, designing things and finding um, a flow. It's like a puzzle you get to put together. Um, so for me, um, when I'm doing like a smaller anthology, I think it's important um, 
when I give the artist the initial prompt, I'm thinking about what is this book going to look like? What can unify this book? Um, when I did Hanadoki Kira, I mean, I'll speak to my own things. I can't speak to everybody else. But um, to me, I unified everything by having everyone um, use the same color. And the prompt was, what is this shoujo to you? Like, what does the shoujo genre mean to you? Um, and so that was really it. It was very open-ended. Um, and, you know, you've got one color, this one color that kind of makes this whole book really come together, despite the fact that everyone in this book is a completely different style, different place in their life. Um, when I'm doing um, A Thousand One Nights, which is a completely you know, huge opposite from this tiny precious thing, um, I've actually split it up, Kevin and I, into three books. Each book has a loose theme based on sort of what we feel are the qualities of night. So we've got like wisdom and courage, um, et cetera. And, um, yeah, right? Good points. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and finding stories that sort of fit into these um, books are great. And um, I think it's also a little bit communicating with your, your artists as well, you know, making sure that the initial prompt that you give will elicit some great work. Um, and then physically putting the book together, um, I use InDesign. I don't know if you guys want to get like super technical. Um, but yeah, I will use InDesign and, you know, sometimes I'll make notes to myself too about what the flow is. Um, for Hanadoki Kiro, there's a very specific flow where it starts out kind of mysterious and then I have a couple of stories that I put that are a little more of a downer followed by some that are a little more of an upper and there's just sort of this flow um, where different stories have, some are very sad, some are very, you know, deep and just letting them be themselves and flow into it. Um, I also thought it was important to show drafts to certain neutral parties because um, I'm very bad at correcting my own mistakes. So it's important for me to get fresh eyes and fresh opinions to say, hey, how do you like this? Do you think these stories sound good together? Like, is this sort of a good pairing? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I like putting the book together a lot as well, but like the last issue of Suspect Device, things seem to get harder and harder. Like I use a company called Winko Print in Queens and I recommended the last time we did a book, my um, the guy who put together all my files, because I don't really know how to do that, he told me that they kept on telling him that the color spreads had to be in different spots. So we went from doing the first issue, which was black and white, to the second issue that had like a, it was 120 pages with big color spreads. And he was like, I swear they're changing it every time. And um, I recommended Heather Benjamin go to Winko Print as well. And she had the same problem with them that they had her, they kept on coming back and telling her there's some kind of technical reason that she didn't get, that she said she had to send it back and forth like 18 times. So the last book, I mean, I was working full time. My, my um, uh, the design guy, he was or the co-editor. He just was, he told me that, uh, he just ended up putting it together himself because he had to go with where they told him the color spreads were. So that kind of kind of made it less fun um, that uh, I wasn't able to just go in and like push the stuff around. And I ended up saying, well, I invited these people. I know that they had a share, you know, they all have a shared aesthetic. And uh, Raymond Pettibone once told me that he, when he does his collages, he doesn't try to put them in any order. He just shuffles them around randomly. And he says like what you do at random is going to be more interesting than what you aesthetically than what you would try to do. <laughs> so I try to, I try, especially if an anthology, you know, I mean, as long as you don't have, you know, a four page story where the four pages aren't in the right order. Um, <laughs> I tried to keep that in mind, but it did kind of, did kind of take some of the joy out of it, I got to say. I, uh, I, I have, I, I have less to say about this because we, the nine stories that are in Cartosia Tales are always in the same order on the, the way the map runs. Uh, like it goes from the uh, northwest, north central, northeast, uh, like across the map as if you'd numbered the grid one through nine. Um, and they always come in the same order, um, although different people are drawing them. I do get to, it, usually we have one or two little one page things in the comic as well. So there are moments where I get to decide whether there's going to be a page turn after page one or after page two. Like, is this is this four-page comic going to be two two-page two two two-page spreads, or is it going to be a right-hand page and then a spread and then a left-hand page? Um, 
And so I read the comics looking to see, well, all right, well, what kind of an effect is that page turn going to have if I put it here? Uh, if it looks good to me, then I'll try to make sure that it starts on an odd-numbered page. But um, sometimes I can't even manage that, like uh, because we'll have a, a center spread that needs to be uh, together. That needs to be, like if we have a maze in the middle of the book, then it has to be right there in the middle. And I stupidly, I've made this plan. Oh, there'll be nine sectors, nine different stories, four pages each. That's 36 pages, and then I can add more if I need to. It didn't occur to me that if I had a center spread and I had nine, you may be thinking this through. Mm -hmm. If I had a center spread and nine stories, they could not be evenly distributed around the center spread because that would mean four and a half stories <laughs> on either side. Um, so mm. sometimes I have to come up with a couple of pages quick in order to make the book complete. Um, or uh, this most recent issue, we got around that by having this, the story I knew was gonna be in the middle had its middle two pages be a continuous two page spread. Um, we always try to do something with that center spread because it's really easy to make it into something cool. But, um, but yeah, I don't get a lot of choice. I don't get to mix it like a mixtape and actually uh, in this in one, this issue and then the one coming up, there are characters moving across the map. This like one guy starts in the west. He begins like before the issue happens. He's in the west, and he's also in in an eastern part at the in this issue. And he actually moves across the map. He's in three. You, you see him in three of the stories in this issue, but the, because he's moving from west to east, and the stories go run from east to west. Or maybe I've got it backwards. I'm trying to trying to show you with my hands what you would see. He's moving in that direction across the map, but this story happens first. <laughs> so you see him at the end of his trip before you read the story that happens at the beginning of his trip. And I, I you know, what could I do? I could either put the stories in the wrong order or have you see the end of his trip before he got there or before he left. See him get there before he left. Well, it definitely speaks to the point of planning things. Um, you know, for some things, you might want to leave it open-ended, but for other things, you might want to say, listen, everyone, you get up to, you know, four pages, or everyone, you just get two pages, or more than that, you know. Um, but knowing that, you know, your your spreads have to be divisible by a specific number, um, communicating and specking out the kind of printer that you want ahead of time, um, I really can't stress enough, you know, planning and thinking about, you know, things ahead of time. That way, when you talk to the artist, like, it's very clear. You can give them a spec sheet and say, this is what I want, this is the size, give them a template, go. All right, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip my next question and go straight into a sort of larger topic so that we have a few minutes left at the end for some questions. So ignore this slide, and we're going Aww. straight That's into... That's pretty. <laughs> yeah, it's a big Ooh. transition. What about Kickstarter? So I talked to Jamie Tanner, who's the head of the comics division of Kickstarter, about how anthologies are insanely popular on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. But in general, comic book sales and you know, bigger publishers, anthologies are not not very popular at all. They're seen as sort of a risk yeah. because it's yeah. different artists. It's, you know, you're sort of gambling on possibly a gimmick. Um, they're not really that prone to take a chance on it. But Kickstarter sees insane success with anthologies. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how Kickstarter has affected your ability to create an anthology and if you could have even made your project without Kickstarter. And then just sort of why do you think Kickstarter has helped drive the popularity of anthologies? Well for us, uh, that's that's our little Nemo book right there. Um, that A book like that would never have been possible uh, without Kickstarter for us. I mean it's at this gi gigantic book with these big name contributors, it would have been impossible to generate enough money to create a book like that, especially for what is a relatively obscure topic of a cartoonist from 1905. Um, but it is, it's interesting what you're saying about, uh, you know, anthologies are a tough sell in the direct market, but they do so well on Kickstarter. I just think it's because they're kind of made for the age of social media. Yeah. Um, because you have, like we had 140 people uh, in our little Nemo book, uh, and a lot of those people have like millions of followers on Twitter and stuff like that. Um, so you have this whole like army of people who can promote the book. That doesn't necessarily help when you're trying to sell the book 
to comic retailers who are just looking at, at previews and deciding whether or not to order something. But when people are online um, seeing that 10 of their friends like all tweeted about the same uh, Kickstarter project, um, you're much more likely to get their attention. So yeah, I, think, I, I think crowdfunding and social media and stuff are kind of the reason for the resurgence of the anthology as like a vital art form when it had kind of died out. I feel like 15 years ago there were like no more anthologies for a little while, um, but now there are a billion. Yeah, um, Kickstarter is the greatest thing, I mean, to me, um, because a lot of the anthologies that I work on are topics that are super obscure, like no one's ever going to publish. Um, but to me, it helps myself and other artists express these topics and um, these feelings that we want to do and we want to, you know, show with a lot of different artists that, you know, some of these artists have a very distinct style that might not be mainstream or whatever. But to me, all art is awesome and it should be together. And um, Kickstarter gives that base. Um, I like to do sort of a linchpin kind of um, theory, so you can see how conniving I am, um, where you know you have a few artists that maybe aren't Tumblr famous, but their art is amazing and valid. You ask a couple people that you know definitely have the following, and then you get everyone to work together. So you know it benefits everyone who's involved, and Kickstarter is this platform that you can get your voice out to people beyond even who's in your anthology. Um, so I think it's it's nothing but good. Um, my, I guess, caution, if I would say, is just, you know, again, make sure you plan, make sure you have the math. Um, everyone always runs out on shipping and things like that. So talk to people who have done it before, you know, attend Kickstarter panels. And, you know, you guys are here, so you're starting to do the right thing already. Um, but don't let Kickstarter control you. Make sure that you have, you know, your shit together. <laughs> I feel like if you're a little bit short on money, it's, you're still so far ahead than you would have been in the past. I mean, where you're looking at spending $500 out of shipping as opposed to a whole $2,000 printing bill or $4,000 printing bill, you're still, that's like, if you have to go into your pocket for that, you're still so far ahead. I mean, um, the other thing is, uh, I feel like the psychology of, of Kickstarters being successful, it's a little bit of how, like, there might be a band who has who isn't a big band, but they have a very, like a very, um, you know, devoted following. Devoted following. It's like that. That can really um, people who love like Little Nemo or love like uh, Nancy or something like that. They're really intense about it. And so in my case, I don't have like I don't, I don't have like a thirty thousand dollar success in the Kickstarter, but I've made you know. I'll do okay, and that's about what I'd expect because people think people are about it. Pe the small amount of people who are into it are way into it, and then you have people. It's a mix of all the elements we're talking about. You have the added element of the talent who's involved, and th and the following that they bring, and then if it's a cultural thing, like I'm, I'm somebody mentioned Hazel and Chainmail Bikini. I understand she made like. Thirty thousand dollars for something she was asking for five thousand dollars for or ten thousand, and that that's because it, it's partially because it's gaming. She's making an excellent project, and she's also making it about gaming culture. And so that's not the small band with the little fervent following. That's a big topic that people are really obsessive about. So all these things add up, and you know they shake out. If you have a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, and a little bit of column C, you'll have a good, successful Kickstarter. And then um, also, it's good to have like a funny, a funny video. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you should make a video funny. Yeah. I think the more sincere you can be in a Kickstarter video, the better. Because if you have a really slick presentation, people are like, well, why do you need my money? But if you're just sincere and you talk from your heart and you're a little dorky, people are like, dude, take my money. I right, should be funny and dorky. Funny and dorky. Sincere. The While nice thing about, about the, the, the fact of a Kickstarter video is that it lets you tell, it lets you turn this book into like a story that you're telling to people before the book even exists. Instead of it just being like a product that you're creating to sell people, it lets you like bring people like into your process of making this thing and tell them a story about it that like, that engages people in a much deeper way than just like, here's this this item that you might want to buy. Um, and I think that's like a pretty powerful thing. It like, it builds like a deeper level of engagement uh, with something like a publishing company that's kind of like historically sort of a blank slate. Like, oh, they put out these books. I like the books or don't. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're suddenly the publishing company, so you can do whatever you want with it. And people can work directly with you and have all that transparency. Yeah. All right, since we're almost out of time, I'm going to jump to the last question, and that's just if you guys had one takeaway for people here, besides how wonderful these transitions are, uh, what would you say about anthologies in general? Anthologies are wonderful. I encourage all of you to go out and make them. There can never be enough. If there's something you're passionate about, you can do it. You just have to find the right people, ask as many questions as you can, and don't give up. I'm just thinking about the corrupt, soulless pizza anthologist who <laughs> hates pizza and just gets nauseous every time he looks at the pages don't of this be comic. Don't be that person. Scratch and or sniff. Or ma maybe do. I don't know. That sounds like a very unique and exciting person to me. <laughs> but I don't know. I do. I, I think putting together anthologies is great because you learn so much stuff. If you like, want to get, if you're like a maker of comics and you want to get deeper into yeah, the comic industry, bigger. get more involved with more people, become like a bigger part of this community that exists in comics, um, and learn all kinds of stuff about book production, about uh, about like working with artists. Um, it's an, um, there's nothing else. It's like it's a master class in just how to do comic stuff. So I like the idea that everybody should make an anthology, regardless of what what it is. My, my first two rules for uh, collaboration are um, work with people you trust and um, trust the people you work with. Like, like you can't, you don't want to pick somebody to work with that you don't know well enough that you could actually trust them. But on the other hand, having brought people in, you want to be able to hand things over to them and really say, you know, you, you, I brought you into this because I trust you. I think you're going to do something cool. If it if that's your idea, I want to do it. You know, make make the neat thing that you're thinking of. Like you, I, I I'm in a position as an editor where I could say, oh, I don't think that's going to work. But I I've got to I always got to trust the people that I'm working with. There's a social aspect that I think is, for me, it's one of the most positive byproducts of being involved in the anthologies. Um, not only. Once you start getting involved, you put a comic out because it's a topic you're interested in, then you start to, you start, there's a, um, creates ripples and you can, other people can become um, aware of you. And then all of a sudden, like somebody, like Box Brown, he's done wrestling comics. And all of a sudden, all these people are from the field of pro wrestling, they've, they've read his book. And like Tom Neely has done the Henry and Glenn anthology, and you know all of a sudden he has these heavy metal icons like doing an intro for his book. Um, I've had like I became friends with like this punk rock singer who, uh, because I portrayed him in the Henry, Henry and Glenn anthology, and then also you know you start to get associated with the topic. So that guy will be that person will be the um, gamer person, and that person will be the punk rock artist, and that person will be the uh, pro wrestling artist, and then you have all these up other opportunities as you brand yourself that way, not you know to start to start to work with your heroes. That's great. I want everyone to give a round of applause to our wonderful panel. We unfortunately don't have any time for questions. I don't want to eat into the next panel, but after some more amazing transitions. Um, come see us at our free, tables. Yeah, feel free to come up and yeah. talk to anybody here and visit our tables. Decent. Thank yeah, you all like for up, coming. Upstairs, come to our tables and br bring wallets if you have them. But come to our <laughs> tables upstairs. Thank you, guys.